The Mysticism of Mary Everest Poole by Geoffrey D. Lavoie Narrated by Liz Madden Mary Everest remains best known for, if known at all, her marriage to the mathematics professor George Boole, as well as for her writings on math and child psychology. Yet, her religious views were unique and deserve to be explored. Mary Everest was born in 1832, growing up in France which made her fluent in both English and French. By her own admission, French was her primary tongue, as she thought and dreamed in this beautiful language. Mary grew up the daughter of a well-liked Protestant pastor named Thomas Everest. Due to some later health issues, her father, Thomas, left his parish and moved the entire family to Paris in order to get closer to the German physician and homeopathic teacher Samuel Hahnemann. Hahnemann was known for his unusual and peculiar homeopathic practices. He promoted an eccentric way of living that included giving cold baths in the middle of winter and going on long walks with empty stomachs early in the morning. The Everests became close followers of Hahnemann and disciples of his unusual methods. Mary remarked about this connection later in 1909. I have been asked to record for the benefit of posterity some episodes of my childhood which involve showing how we children and our mother suffered from father's mistaken devotion to Hahnemann's draconic ideas. I have no hesitation in doing so, as I know that father's greatest wish was that his children should learn from and profit by any mistakes of his which they might detect, especially in the homeopathic philosophy. He told me this more than once. But in order to avoid misunderstandings, I am bound to show that, as far as we children were concerned, the evil was temporary and the good lasting. This note revealed Mary's optimism and her positive outlook regarding her childhood. She would go on to learn mathematics from her father and thoroughly enjoyed being able to solve problems using the power of her own mind and intellect. Mary left school early and began involving herself in her father's ministry at the church. She taught Sunday school, visited the elderly and sick, and wrote out her father's weekly sermons. Then her life forever changed. In 1850, she visited an uncle who was a professor at Queen's College. It was here that she was introduced to George Boole, a professor of mathematics at the college. Boole was 17 years Mary senior. However, a love of mathematics united them and together they explored the wonders of nature and poetry. In 1855, Mary's father passed away and Boole and Mary were engaged and married. They had five daughters and shared a relatively happy life. On occasion, Mary would tutor her husband's students with her profound understanding of math. Mary also served as an editor and proofreader for all of her husband's major books and papers. Then, unexpectedly, in 1864, Boole passed on from this plane, leaving Mary a widow at the young age of 32. Soon after his death, at the request of the college's president, founder and Christian socialist Frederick Denison Morris, Mary began working at Queen's College as a, quote, librarian. She indirectly referenced this move, along with the racist and sexist ethics of the era, observing the following. At that time, Cambridge and Oxford gave no degrees either to Jews or to women. Queen's College had no degrees to confer. It was merely educational. The pupils were all women, the professors all men, Women were admitted on the teaching staff only as subordinate assistants. Mary grew up in a time period when sexism, classism and anti-Semitism was rampant and deeply embedded into the fabric of culture. Still, Mary was not one to shy away from social justice. She was proud of her national heritage and in the late 1870s wrote for such Jewish weekly press outfits as The Jewish Chronicle, The Jewish Standard, the Occident, the American Israelite, the Banner of Israel, and the Jewish Messenger. 
She even suggested a physical solution for this anti-Semitism in an article titled Anti-Semitic Hysteria, published in The Unknown World, 1895. We have in Judaism a large store of positive magnetism, which as long as it remains uninvestigated and unknown, must be a perennial cause of confusion, misapprehension, and socially unstable equilibrium. It was also during this time that Mary attempted to publish her book, The Message of Psychic Science. However, Morris, the president of Queen's College, prevented its publication. The reason for this intervention was hinted at by Mary's own pen that Morris believed the Church of England system made possible an indefinite expansion of liberality. Whatever that meant, based on this resistance and other ongoing concerns, she left the college and became a secretary for the famed surgeon and author James Hinton. Mary was hired as a lecturer at the London School of Medicine for Women and published numerous books and articles. In her book, Symbolical Methods of Study, 1884, she introduced the notion of psychic science and her treatise, The Mathematical Psychology of Grattry and Boole, attempted a psychological interpretation of her husband's work in the spirit of the French mystic Auguste Grattry. In the end, Mary's two loves connected two seemingly opposite fields of study, mysticism and mathematics. In her writings, Lectures on the Logic of Arithmetic, 1903, and The Preparation of the Child for Science, 1904, Mary combined psychology with elementary education and the fields of science and mathematics. Her advanced comprehension of children's unconscious thought process and development was far advanced for her time. Both of these works were highly influential, and Mary could be seen as a pioneer in the field of math and developmental psychology. She even invented something called the Boole Curve Sewing Card, which was a precursor to the pins and metal wire art form used today, which helped to construct geometric patterns. These affiliations led her to participate in two different organizations, the Parents' National Educational Union and the Christo Theosophical Society, a society that combined mysticism and socialism together. She spoke often at these two groups and was a dedicated member of the CTS and a supporter of its founder, G. W. Allen. In the final months of her life, Mary's hearing and eyesight began to fail. Her sight and hearing got progressively worse, and she invented little games to improve these basic functions. In 1916, at the age of 84, Mary passed away having always struggled to find her place in the male-dominated world of Victorian academia. Mary was passionate about gender equality, even though she rarely contributed to the women's suffrage movement. In 1931, Mary's collected works were published posthumously, and they remain an eclectic mix of insight, innovation, and an incomprehensible fusion of mathematics, religion, and philosophy. Mary's own view of phenomena and spiritualism was extremely logical and rational, as remarked in her work The Forging of Passion into Power. In this book, her views on seeing visions and hearing voices was noted. The majority first think of an object or sound, or scent or flavor, and then picture or imagine it. But some see or hear or smell or taste it in imagination and only afterwards consciously think of it. To this latter mode of perception is commonly given such names as clairvoyance, clairaudience, etc. It is normal and natural and healthy as the other, though as yet less usual. Most people think of an idea and then write it down. To some it comes natural to write first and then receive the idea into consciousness by reading it in their own handwriting. Thus, Mary's views on spiritualist phenomena remained rational and reflected her own unique views of Christianity. Her view on the nature of dreams deserves some consideration for their importance in everyday life. Mary wrote a letter concerning the role of dreams in 1894. There is a thing I did not say the other day to which your attention ought to be called, the matter of dreams. But if you want to become a seer of God, 
you must arrest the mischief at a still higher stage, and that stage is marked by dreams. For example, I occasionally dream of finding myself in the street without proper clothing, either without bonnet and cloak, or even in my nightdress. I know, then, that my brain is in a condition of unseeming self-exposure, that if I don't heed myself carefully, I shall send something to the press for which I shall be sorry afterwards, about my personal feelings, loves, dislikes, etc. After such a dream as that, I would withhold any personal revelation as to which there could be the shadow of a doubt that it comes in artistically and correctly. I should know that my immediate judgment was likely to err on the side of too much personal exposure. If I dreamed of finding treasure, or I dreamed of finding any trifle, and felt out of proportion in my dream, I would then discount any expectations I might be forming awake about the result of any work or attempt of mine. If I dreamed of ruin, or dreamed of losing a trifle and felt too sorry about it, I would say to myself, on waking, whatever goes wrong for the next few days will seem to me more serious than it is. I must discount regrets. I dream sometimes about unpleasant trifling things, nasty insects, etc., etc. I know then that I am in danger of attending unduly to unpleasant details of a subject, that it will be safer for me, for the present, to avoid detail lest I should handle it wrongly, and fix my attention on big principles, and so on. You will observe that I have stated no theory as to whether dreams are the mere automatic product of the brain when uncontrolled by reason, or the expression of the special way it responds, at the moment, to influences from the unseen. Whatever I believe on that subject matters nothing to you. What matters to you is that you should learn to use your dreams as guides among the dangers that beset whoever is not satisfied with being a mere philosopher, but wants truly to see God. For all practical purposes, dreams are sent by God for the training of his prophets, and are meant to be read by contraries, that is, as indicators of impending error. Dreams and mysticism played an important role in Mary's life and beliefs, yet it is unfortunate that she remains better known for her mathematics while her mysticism reveals a deeper understanding of the supernatural, the divine, and ultimate reality. The Mysticism of Mary Everest Boole by Geoffrey D. Lavoie Narrated by Liz Madden Mary Everest remains best known 